Welcome back. In previous sessions, you determined customer needs and translated them into your dialect. Your mission for this session is to establish units of measure for each customer need. Good quality planning requires measurement of customer needs. As the saying goes, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Some essential information on customer needs can be adequately conveyed by words. However, higher precision is attained when we say it in numbers. Surveys consistently show that airline passengers give high priority to prompt delivery of their baggage. But what is meant by prompt delivery? When prompt is defined in minutes, precision of communication rises remarkably. To say it in numbers requires that we create a system of measurement consisting of a unit of measure and a sensor. The unit of measure permits quantification of a product feature. The sensor is a method or instrument which can carry out the evaluation and state the findings in terms of the unit of measure. We'll discuss units of measure during this session and discuss sensors during the next session. A system of measurement helps at every step of the quality planning journey to evaluate customer needs, to evaluate product and process features, to establish optimal product and process goals. In addition, measurement helps us to deal with other quality-related phenomena, product value, saleability of product, quality of competing products, cost of attaining quality, cost of poor quality. In those steps of the quality planning journey, product quality is judged by numerous customers, both internal and external. The variety of product features, planning steps, and customers collectively gives rise to a wide variety of units of measure. For all units of measure, we need precise definition. For some units, the work of definition is complete. Such physical units as a meter of length, a second of time, or a kilogram of mass have been defined with extreme precision and have been standardized. Most other units are not defined with such precision, nor is that a problem. What is needed is sufficient precision to assure good communication of customer needs. In the late 1980s, a storm of complaint developed among airline passengers in the United States over flight delays. The Federal Aviation Agency responded by requiring airlines to report the percentage of their flights delayed. It was vital that there be a precise definition of delay. A delayed flight, it was agreed, was one which arrived 15 minutes or more after its scheduled arrival time. For safety reasons, delays for mechanical difficulties were exempted from the reports. Some product features seem to stand apart from the world of physical things. Quality of service often includes courtesy as a significant quality feature. Even in the case of physical goods, there are product features such as appearance, taste, aroma, feel. How do we establish units of measure for such abstractions? One answer is to quantify the number of violations of the abstraction. Workplace safety is an abstraction, but we can measure workplace safety by conducting an audit of workplace conditions against a checklist of conditions required for safety. The number of violations is a measure of absence of workplace safety. Also, we can count the instances of lack of safety, that is, occurrence of accidents, and so on. In such cases, it is quite common to go a step further and establish an index, such as accidents per million employee hours worked. Another approach for dealing with abstractions is to break them up into measurable elements. Hotel room appearance is certainly a quality feature. 
but it also seems like an abstraction. However, we can dig in and identify those specifics which collectively constitute appearance. The specifics might include the condition of the carpet, plumbing, lighting, linens, window, sink, and tub. Identifying these specifics also simplifies the job of establishing units of measure. Our extensive experience in establishing units of measure enables us to list the main criteria to be met by the ideal unit of measure. Use this as a checklist as you establish units of measure for your planning project. First, the ideal unit of measure reflects a customer need, whether the customer is internal or external. A passenger airline sold cargo delivery service as a means to use the excess capacity in the aircraft cargo bay. The airline promised prompt delivery and the customers expected it. An audit revealed delivery times as long as four days. The managers were surprised at this poor performance. What went wrong? The company promised prompt delivery, but there was no unit of measure for promptness. So there was no way for managers to manage promptness. What the managers did measure was percent utilization of the cargo bay, and that they did manage. Unfortunately, there was no correlation between percent utilization of the cargo bay and promptness of delivery. So the promise of prompt delivery just wasn't kept. The second criterion for the ideal unit of measure is that it provides an agreed basis for decision making. Measurement is done to support decision making with facts. The more valid your measurement concept, the greater the likelihood of securing a meeting of the minds. In the frozen food industry, a major crop is peas. For years, the food processors bought the peas by weight, but with the proviso that the peas must be tender. Weight could be measured precisely, but there were endless debates about tenderness. A major complication was the fact that during the ripening period of several days, peas double their weight but lose their tenderness. The solution? A new sensor was developed, an instrument called a tenderometer to measure tenderness. Thereafter, peas were purchased by weight but on a sliding scale of price based on tenderometer readings. The third criterion for the ideal unit of measure is that it be understandable. This is seldom a problem with technological units, meters, seconds, kilograms. However, many units of measure at the managerial level involve words which lack standardized meanings or involve formulas of undue complexity. Any such vagueness or complexity becomes a natural source of suspicion and discord. A case in point is mortality rate, which is widely used in the healthcare industry. In 1987, the Eisenhower Medical Center in Rancho Mirage, California, advertised that it had the lowest mortality rate for heart bypass surgery in the country. The claim was based on data from hospitals which had performed 150 or more such operations on Medicare patients in 1984. The data showed one death for 161 operations performed or a mortality rate of 0.6%. Fifth on the list was a hospital with a mortality rate of 1.7%, or three deaths for 175 operations. Among competing hospitals, controversy arose over the implied claim that this comparison of mortality rates established Eisenhower Medical Center as the best place for bypass surgery. Typical questions were, is this hospital selecting patients with the most favorable prognosis? Do the differences among hospital mortality rates reflect real differences in patient care or just random variation? Are the basic data accurate? A fourth criterion for the ideal unit of measure is that it can be broadly applied. At all levels of the organization, you need to answer questions such as, is our quality getting better or worse? Are we competitive with others? Which one of our operations provides the best quality? How can we bring all operations up to the level of the best? Units of measure, which are broadly applicable, can help you answer such questions. 
Common forms of broadly applicable units are ratios and percentages such as percent of orders which represent repeat business, defects per 100 automobiles, failures per 100 appliances during the first 10 years of operation. At the managerial level, you have further need for breadth of application. Common units of measure are required to evaluate the performance of various segments of the organization, divisions, offices, factories, laboratories, warehouses. In the case of financial performance, there are such common units of measure, return on investment, cost to sales ratio. These units of measure have evolved over the centuries. We are now in the early stages of a similar evolution in common units of measure for quality. Again, ratios and percentages facilitate comparison even across functions. Typical units of measure are percent of products produced with no rework, repair, or adjustment. This is often called true yield. Percent of employee hours devoted to rework and repair. Ratio of cost of poor quality to sales. A fifth criterion for the ideal unit of measure is that it can be uniformly interpreted. Identical numbers can nevertheless result in widely different interpretations. What is critical is whether the units of measure have been defined with adequate precision. A report on quality of teller transactions in a bank includes number of errors per thousand transactions. One kind of error is a data entry error. Such an error can result in a shortage in a customer account. Should the same word error be used to describe failure of the teller to say thank you? In a report of defects under warranty, failure of your new car to start and a loose sun visor are both conditions which are covered by warranty. Should the same word defect be used to describe these very different conditions? The lesson for your project is that in establishing units of measure, you must define them with sufficient precision to avoid ambiguity. Finally, the ideal unit of measure is compatible with existing sensors. Measurement of quality is wonderfully simple when there's a ready-made sensor instrument which can be plugged in. It's clear that a unit of measure for which there is no sensor is not ideal. However, the unit of measure may be important enough to require that you invent a sensor, as was the case with the invention of the P-tenderometer. Creating a managerial unit of measure can be surprisingly simple. Once the need is publicized, human ingenuity has a way of responding to the challenge. During the 1980s, many companies undertook quality improvement on an accelerated project-by-project -project basis. The need arose to evaluate progress. One new measure which emerged was percent of managerial personnel active on quality improvement projects. Some companies have undertaken to estimate the cost of poor quality and to publish the results in order to observe trends or to compare performance of multiple organization units. To publish such information requires creation of a unit of measure. In this case, some sort of index or ratio. There have been many nominations for structuring the ratio. In all cases, the numerator is the same, the cost of poor quality in money. The denominators in use include sales, operating hours, standard operating cost, and still others. Each denominator has a logic to support it. However, what is decisive is the judgment of the customers, the managers, after they have been exposed to the various units of measure. To provide managers with such exposure, indexes are published in several of the nominated versions. Then, based on the experience of the managers, the most meaningful units of measure are retained and the rest are discarded. Once a unit of measure is established, add it to the units of measure column in the product design spreadsheet. Returning to the automobile heating example, heat output is described in terms of airflow quantity, temperature, and time for the heater to reach design output after cold engines start up. In the US, it is conventional to use CFM, cubic feet per minute, degrees Fahrenheit, and minutes to measure those quantities. 
sound level will be judged subjectively. That's the way the consumer does it, so that's the way the designers will do it. As to leaks, the question is, does it leak or not? So the unit of measure is yes or no. Precision in matters of quality requires that you say it in numbers. If you can measure it, you can more effectively manage it. To say it in numbers requires, for each customer need, a unit of measure and a sensor. All units of measure require precise definition. Units of measure for abstractions may be established by counting the violations or by breaking up the abstraction into measurable elements. An ideal unit of measure reflects the customer's need, provides an agreed basis for decision making, is understandable, applies broadly, may be interpreted uniformly, and is compatible with existing sensors. In the next session, you will continue the examination of measurement. Once you have established units of measure, you need a sensor with which to establish measurement. Sensors will be the subject of the next session. I'll see you then.